Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome back to Top Traders Roundtable, a podcast series on managed futures brought to you by CME Group, where I continue my conversation with Michael Adam, David Harding, and Marty Luick, also known as the original founders of AHL and later Aspect Capital and Winton Capital, and who are without a doubt some of the most influential individuals within the managed futures industry. I can't help but remind you of, of your father, who's who came when we we were starting early uh, in the early to mid eighties. He was terribly disillusioned with the stock market, wasn't he? I mean, he yeah. couldn't have been. He was utterly disillusioned. That was his view. He, he he took me aside and said, "I think there needs to be something better, you know." And that's what you guys can develop something better mm. because he was. That was, I mean. What he didn't know is it was the early years of a new bull market, which was to go on for 15 years. Yes. I was no more bullish than he was at the time. Uh, but he was very pessimistic because that comment was shaped by being in the aftermath of 15 years. The market didn't go up from 68 to 82, so it was 14 years of sideways. Mm. Uh, and that's what had conditioned his recent investing experience, mm. I'm sure. No, absolutely. I think it was once said that the biggest room of all is the room for improvement. And by this, I mean that when I look at your achievements, I see a continuing sort of hunger for, for learning. But what about the flip side? You touched upon it, I think, earlier today about unlearning. I mean, are there certain things that you found really important to unlearn in order to continue to improve your strategies? Uh, things that you thought were really good only to realize that they were in fact flawed and, and much riskier than you thought? Well, that's probably a different view amongst the three of us because I remember in the early days, David had an office where what he would do is he was surrounded by data. So literally, it was, it was almost like a. And David used, used his desk used to be a complete chaotic mess full of cuttings from the Wall Street Journal and you know bits of paper and notes and so forth. My desk was always completely clean, and I thought that that was because I was more organised and focused than David, and he his. He used to say to me, empty desk, empty mind. So <laughs> I've always believed that one of the biggest challenges in systematic trading is not remembering what you know. It's, it's having the discipline to forget what you know because applying what you know to the next thing you do is a very powerful hidden form of optimization. Mm -hmm. So I think that building into research processes the sort of ins the, the, the organized capacity and insistence that people forget, and also recruiting people who never worked in the field before, always, always feeding people who aren't polluted by knowing stuff is really, really important. On the other hand, it's very hard to develop systematic training if you don't have a real feel for the way markets work. So there's this constant mm -hmm. battle, I think, between you know what, you, what insights you have what wisdom you have on the one hand, and, and yet have the ability to forget the specifics. And I, I don't have an answer to that. I think it's extremely hard to do. Yeah, I think what you said there is, is spot on. Also, with a lot of the people we've recruited, it's been the struggle has been to get them to forget the efficient market theory. So, you know, they a lot you need clever people who are good at mathematics and computer science and typically you get them because they've passed degrees and exams and so on and so forth. And they've often been taught you know, the efficient market theory, which is a beguiling theory because the mathematics is appealing and it's difficult, so it's something they can master. And then having mastered that, they believe it to be true, most of them. Most people having mastered something difficult. Mm. So I think, you know, education can 
crush creativity because mm. uh, it, it can crush it. It's, it's interesting that Steve Jobs didn't actually get a degree, isn't it? He, he went off and did a smorgasbord of courses, including famously calligraphy. Yeah. And I think, sadly, that over-educated people probably can know too much to to be creative having said that to be creative in a field obviously you need to know about that field which requires a lot of education so, so that's the paradox real, I think yeah, Mike, Mike was referring yes. to so I, I, th- I think well, I can't remember what the question was <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, things, but things unlearning. That we unlearned oh unlearning yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I, I think it... I, I, I bring you know back in the day I, I think that the unlearning or rather the lesson that we learn early quickly and has stood us well as you know i think david you referred to the the tendency to over optimize i think mm. we had some brilliant forays into the world of over optimization we could make those simulations go from <laughs> bottom left to top right like a rocket ship and uh, and funny enough when you start trading it it the inflection point was so remarkable to, so i think that was a, a lesson we unlearned our our desire to optimize pretty What I quickly. find annoying, you know, until we all we're all becoming crabby old men. But what I find <laughs> annoying is I frequently see big companies, uh, you know, it, putting True. out simulations that are over optimized in the same way that our simulations were over optimized thirty years ago. Yeah. And, you think uh, and big that? companies will yeah. put those things out and they will sell them to investors, uh, and that's sanctioned by the authorities. Yeah. What used to be banned, which is marketing simulated track records, has now apparently become legal because you just call it an index. You know, so, so uh, and it's frustrating. Yeah, That's no, frustrating. It, 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 it is. It is. Um, looking at, at at the various the sort of moves that regulators have made in response to various crises. Looking at, yeah, I mean those things. I mean, yeah, I mean they shouldn't be annoying, but they are. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they just exactly. are. When, when, you know, when when you when you watch regulators doing things, which you could say, now that's really really stupid, and they just willfully and they just willfully do it, and it has exactly the result you'd predict, and it is it is it is annoying. So the world actually, the good news is the world is pr- apparently pretty good at forgetting, mm. given that it, is. it keeps making the same mistake again and again and again. So in a way, you know, yeah, maybe we're better at forgetting than we think. You know, but maybe that isn't a bad thing in the end. Sure. <laughs> Marty, if you look at your own strategy and maybe David uh, uh, as well, what do you least like about it, and and what are the things you would like to to improve? Gosh, um, interesting question, Niels. Uh, you know, the sort of pat answer is or, or, always be paranoid, mm. and always be paranoid about every part of it because, I mean, you've heard me bang on about this before, is that any of these systematic methods or systematic investment strategies is only as weak as its as its weakest part. Mm. So you can't say, well, I'm looking for this fantastic new machine learn, you know system that is always right on, on tomorrow's trade. A, as we've just covered, you know, you're unlikely to find that and you well, you don't believe it if you do, and B, how you put all those models together, how you risk manage it, how you execute it is all is crucial to having a you know an overall efficacious system. So I'm I'm not going to pinpoint one area of it that today I think is flawed. I think the whole thing is always in need of constant care and attention. You know, we spent a, an awful lot of time and money on improving the execution um, of of what we do, and I think we got that to a you know a really great place and I think that there's more we can do. I think the exchanges and the instruments have moved on to a place and we need to you know, continue to invest and maybe turn the crosshairs a little bit more in that direction for a while. But no, no single area, Niels. Everything, everything needs to be improved. Your thoughts, David? Well, I least like the bits where we go down and I most like the bits where we go up and I'd like to go up more of the time and down less of the time and everything about obviously my corporate strategy and that of Winton is designed to achieve that aim. It sounds a bit trite but I'm not going to repeat what Marty said which is that we're working on everything to try and make things better all the time Uh, but it's a tough business. I mean, I always thought that the major improvement we could have made in the business was to have no clients or employees. So, um, <laughs> so that's I've, what you've so done. Mark. That's what I've done, <laughs> and it really, really works. That's all I can say. Good. <laughs>
Good. Well, let's leave this subject and go on to something completely different as we slowly start bringing our conversation to an end. Now, all of you are relatively young and in good health, but one day... Oh, God, you're a joking. Me. I'm about, not. <laughs> one day, a decision about what's going to happen to the firms you've built has to be made. Is this something that you already think about uh, and maybe have you already decided upon? Absolutely something that we think about. Mm -hmm. you know, as, and as I ask because some firms in the US um, that we know that's been around for a long time, they have kind of done this succession already. So it is coming, uh, I guess. Uh, what, what do you know that we don't, Niels? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, of, of course, one thinks about it. I think the, yeah. uh, we talked about AHL uh, earlier. I feel proud to be a part of having created a business which has gone on after AH and L are, are no longer mm -hmm. involved in it. And I feel the same way about, you know, I hope Aspect mm -hmm. will live long after I'm nothing to do with it, probably thrive. But now I can't tell you that this is this is the individual or that, that's going to take over from me. I think you know, the businesses we've built are substantial and they have some really great people in them. And, you know, I'm not supposed to say this, but I think if I'm not there, it, no, no one will notice. <laughs> oh, well, I, I mean, I agree with that, Marty, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> What about you, David? Do you I'm afraid I've got a bit of a pat answer, which is that our board routinely considers succession planning as part of its normal governance process. And the only thing I would add is that succession planning doesn't mean my successor mm. at every level in the company. Yeah. You have to consider who can replace every person. Succession planning is part of a sort of management philosophy, mm. I have realised. When people used to talk about it, I used to think they're trying to get rid of me, but I've moved past that now. <laughs> uh, and, of course... If you've got succession planning for everyone else in the company, you've kind of got it for you by implication. It is an important discipline, even yeah. if you're not actually planning to retire, but, which I'm not. But one of the great <laughs> benefits of, of having a systematic approach is it's not just a systematic approach because there's a piece of computer code that enshrines when you buy or sell something on a particular, you know, on a particular day at a particular time. But if you look at the inside of a systematic trading business, it's also systematically organised in terms mm. of the roles and responsibilities and who does what. So of all the businesses in which a succession is less of an issue in asset management, systematic trading is, is the easiest to imagine that, that it can have a life beyond the original founders because the, yeah. the reason these, uh, the systematic trading business is successful uh, is, is not just because, of course, of the unrivaled genius of the founder, <laughs> but it's the ability of the founder to organize a business that has a way of doing things that is indeed systematic. In terms of the roles, the responsibilities, and you know the processes that are that are replicatable going forward, and I think that's true of Aspect. It's true of Winton. It's true of so of all. You know, I think succession is almost built in to being systematic. Sure, sure, no, absolutely. Now, if you couldn't leave any of your money to your children, but only a set of investment principles, what would they be? I'll start with you, David, if you don't mind. Well, I think that um, you, you need to have an object for what money is, you know, what you're, what you're trying to achieve. But if you're trying to achieve the maximise it, you know, if you're trying to help them look after their money and steward it and get more wealthy or, you know, even if what, what they choose to do with that wealth is to give it away ultimately like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, then the main principle I direct them to is is compound interest combined with Kelly's criteria. You know, Kelly's criteria is the answer to what you asked about earlier in terms of what's the optimum level of leverage mm. to operate at. You know, there is, if you leverage too highly and you go down 100, as I alluded to, then your compound rate of interest will be zero. But you can always get a bit more. Mm. You can always get a bit more return by leveraging a bit more. So... You know, that leverage may be through the companies you invest in. In Warren Buffett's case, it's by deploying the balance sheet of Geico. You know, he hasn't, he, he famously doesn't borrow lots of money. And I certainly wouldn't advocate borrowing lots of money to leverage up your returns, but you've invested in leveraged businesses. So there's some leverage inherent in your portfolio. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. So one point, you can play on the calculator with the button 1.0, you know, X to the Y, 1.0 X to the power Y. And, um, that's well, there was Einstein who said he could just he could uh, quantum physics. Contemplate. He got that, and he could even contemplate the existence of God. But compound interest 
No. He didn't get. He didn't get. <laughs> so. Anything to add? Well, I'd, I'd answer the, you know, the, I'd add the pat answer of diversification. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's, I've, I've certainly lived by diversified portfolio of investments. Mm. Um, I think I would say focus on what you do, not what you get. And mm -hmm. that would apply to anything in life, including how you invest. Sure, sure. Now, with all the evidence that the managed futures industry, if we call it that, can show today, only a minority of investors have still embraced this as a core part of their portfolio. Why do you think that is? I think there are two parts to it. And so I'm just launching into this. I'm sure the, you'll have the real answer. But first of all, I think there's still, an, you know, what's interesting over the arc of the 30 years that we've been talking about today is when we started talking about employing computers to analyze and invest in financial markets, most people thought we were smoking something. You know, scroll forward to today and it's increasingly you know, accepted and, and expected. You even have this concept of quanta mental where discretionary traders are trading models that are informed by quantitative analysis, go figure. So, but but the first thing is that it's it's still a learning curve. People mm -hmm. are getting more comfortable with quantitative investment as they get more comfortable with some of the ideas behind it. When it was rocket science, when it was a black box, I'm not surprised they couldn't trust it. They mm -hmm. trusted it after it had gone up. They didn't trust it when it had gone down. So th that's the first thing. And then answer number two comes back to the the point that I made about the utility of, mm -hmm. of it. Certainly in you know, if you're talking about managed futures, I think managed futures predominantly is the trend following space, an important diversifying utility, but it's 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 hard to hold. Mm. That's that's the challenge. Mm. What do you think, David? Yeah, I agree with Marty. It's yeah. you know, managed futures is complicated. I don't even think it's desirable that all the investors in the world. Yeah, managed managed futures is pretty complicated. It doesn't have an infinite capacity mm. if everybody in the world decided to put as much money as they, you know, as, as we wanted them to in, there wouldn't be the capacity. So it'll reach its own limits mm. of growth. And, you know, you can see the struggle sure. with that now. Sure, sure, sure. I want to shift gear and ask a little bit about your reflections when we think back of the last 30 years since you founded AHL. Within your long and successful careers, what would you say has been the most important decisions you've made? And also, what's been the decision that's yielded the most surprising result? Well, well the most important decision for me was when uh, I went on holiday for a week and my father fired David and Marty. <laughs> uh, on my 25th birthday it was the decision I made in anger without thought to pick up the computer which had the software on it walk out and with my father's words ringing in my ears that he would disinherit me to keep walking out of the door mm. so it was a decision made in no time that changed completely mm. changed the outcome of my life mm. so it wasn't thoughtful um, it was impetuous turned out to be a great decision. Uh, didn't feel great at the time. So I would say that was the most important single decision in business that I've made. Mm. And was probably the most surprising result. With the, yeah, and it has the one with the most surprising result also. Yes, yeah. I would say it's yeah. that. That's good. What about you, Martin? Um, I thought that was, that was great, Mike. I, I, I sort of felt when the man group brought us out that that was the end of that experiment for me and would you know move on to some new industry so for me it, you know, an important decision was actually doing aspect and realizing you, because because the AHL in a large part was a was a happy accident we we didn't we were uncovering things all of the way and I think there was this sense of how, how long can this Possibly last. This yeah. levitation continue for, and then there was a bit of the realization of actually, it may not be mm. your miraculous levitation. This is something useful, both for me personally and for 
investment community. So that, that was quite an important decision to actually do it. If I say do it again, of course, we had a different utility. We had some different decisions that we made at the start of the business, as I'm sure you did when you started Winton. You didn't want to make some of the mistakes we had made in in uh, along the line in AHL. So that would be my mm -hmm. offering. Mm -hmm. What about you, David? I'm not sure this is the most important, but at some point, mm -hmm. you know, as a result of research, I decided to slow the trading system down a lot, mm -hmm. uh, progressively, and the conventional wisdom was and remains that you do better by, you know, by being a nimble trader, you know, getting in ahead of jumping on the trends before the big beer moths like Winton. But the surprising result is that by going slower, you do better mm. um, and have more capacity. So that's mm. surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What about the future of our industry? What do you think about the opportunities that we have for managed futures if we label it like that in, in today's world? And, and also, I, I can't help asking if you ever think that the media will fully understand what we do. And, and here I am referring to the countless times I've seen you, David, on television being asked, where do you think gold is going for the next six months? <laughs> Yes, no, well, the media, their current preoccupation until very recently was with us being robots, wasn't it? So that was intended to be derogatory, the idea of us being robots. But suddenly robots are in fashion as a result of this machine learning, artificial intelligence craze. So suddenly, having been sort of slightly dissed by the mainstream media for being robots and quants and systems, we now, I, I now found rather improbably that we're we're fashionable, which is funny because we're, as you say, not doing particularly well at the moment. Mm. <laughs> so when we were doing very well, that was a subject of great, mm. great scepticism. Mm. Uh, there isn't a, a lot of... Uh, there was a survey done by the managed futures industry which demonstrated that, you know, hedge fund managers are a particularly disliked and untrusted category of individual. And this was considered by the managed futures industry to be a great source of anxiety that we needed to combat with a lot of positive publicity. Uh, but one of my colleagues pointed out, when you look closer at the rankings, you know, you compare hedge fund managers, they score very low down, but they score the same as film stars and professional athletes, who are also widely distrusted and disliked and so on and so forth. That made me feel a whole lot better because, you know, if someone said people are going to look at you like film stars or athletes, then you think, well, that's not so bad, is it? Uh, people are you know, sort of have an ambivalent relationship with people who have, have achieved a lot or succeeded or made a lot of money. And I guess that enters into the media's coverage of, mm. of hedge fund managers and robot, robot fund managers. Mm. Again, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but talking about the 30-year the arc that went from the uh, that decision Michael mm. spoke about of parting company with his, his father, you know, the inception of, uh, of AHL to where we are today, you know, we've been part of, we've been, a, a, you know, an, an, an integral part of the growth of an industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was a quaint, as you described, David, on the trestle table somewhere in Orlando, you know, an industry, if you generalize that managed futures, or, or I think what David and I do ha has evolved into, you know, the quantitative investment management space, it's it's big, it's important, and it's it's a crucial part of, of investors' portfolios, and, and it's not going away. Mm. <laughs> so it's very important, but it's 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 no panacea, you know. I think continued research, continued skepticism and discipline on, mm. on the statistics. David made a very good point about, you know, it's ironic that, you know, over-optimized systems and models and indices are, uh, you know, there's plenty of them around. What an irony after all this time. Yeah. What about you, Mike? Well, I, I I still think it's a it's 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 a permanent cultural challenge, and I don't think that challenge has changed. And oddly enough, it's is wrapped up in. I mean, I I vividly remember being asked by a client, "So, which way is gold going?" And I said, "I don't know." So when I was CIO at Aspect. So the next question was, uh, you know, well, uh, are you long or short? To which I cheekily said, yes. 
Um, so luckily we did. <laughs> luckily we did have the computers to hand to give the answer. I said, but let me have a look. And I said, oh, we're long. So I said, does that mean that gold is going to go up? And I said, not really. It means almost nothing. So the, the countercultural aspect of, of managed futures is not going to change, which is it, it rests on, 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 on something that, that human beings are very, very uncomfortable with, which is it operates right at the margins of, of statistical significance. Uh, each individual decision is, is spectacularly unreliable, it, almost useless in terms of any day-to-day decision-making. So it, it, it just runs counter to the way that human beings like want the world to be, which is that it's orderly, it has high probability that if you do A, you get B mm. with a degree of certainty. So I think that's always been the struggle in what we do, and I think it will always remain the struggle. The majority and of people are relatively is. uncomfortable with maths and they're very comfortable with stories and narrative. Yeah. Yes, so they're very uncomfortable with, with understanding that actually a huge chunk of all of our lives is, is deeply uncertain extremely unpredictable and and that that means it's always going to be a challenge mm. but that's that's fine yeah. you know that also means that's one of the reasons why people get very well paid for doing it it's because it's not that the systems are complicated this is extremely hard to keep doing it in the face of that uncertainty and that's why the people who do it and do it well tend to end up being very highly rewarded for doing it As we come to the end of our conversation, I just wanted to ask all of you if you would like to bring up anything with each other, <laughs> something <laughs> that you want to ask maybe David uh, about or vice versa, anything you want to bring up? Well, I, I mean, I I think we, we reconciled the, the, the things that caused all the traumas in, in our relationship many, many years ago, and actually re- remarkably quickly after the events that followed them. I mean, we, so from my perspective, absolutely not. I, I feel I feel completely relaxed with Marty and with David and with the way things have worked out for all three of us. Mm-hmm. That's my perspective. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. I'd, I'd just like to ask you when we can get a date in the diary for dinner. A <laughs> <laughs> very well, hard no, man to get okay. hold of. The David. question I would have, and if we do that, who's paying? <laughs> that would be my question. I'm sure we can so come no, up with a I, I, I do. I think I, I'm actually very proud of the fact that uh, all so through all that sort of time, a massive change where we 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 sort of challenged a whole bunch of things and we you know, fought tooth and nail with each other over those issues because we really cared about them and with our counterparts and with the man group to to drive change. As far as I'm aware, no one involved in any of those processes. Look, I think everybody looks back on that time and says, bloody hell, that was productive. Mm. That was amazing. So I, I don't... I mean, I'm not aware of any bad feeling. No, no. <laughs> I mean, I think it leads you me know, nicely into that my, sense? My, my, my final, final question, and that is really, what is the legacy that you want people to think of when they think of AHO? I would love it to be, because there's always this, this sort of sense in the world that everything's already been invented and there's nothing more to be done and that there's no future and you know there's no opportunity or possibility of something different i mean when we started out uh, in ahl um we absolutely challenged the orthodoxy and did something that we were told repeatedly by people who were far more experienced and knew far more than we did that that it would it not only was it not going to work but it couldn't work and i would like the thing that people should take from that going forward is that the future is history that's not yet been written. There's always opportunity for someone to come in and say, hold on a minute, here's something no one's ever thought of before. And it doesn't need to be complex and it doesn't need to be you know, mathematically challenging. It, it can just be someone comes in from stage left and says, what about this? Mm-hmm. So I'd like it to be a, just a, an encouragement to challenge the orthodoxy and not believe well, basically, ignore your old, your elders and your and those who consider themselves wiser. So basically, I'm saying ignore everything I say. <laughs> well, I think it testifies to the fact that efficient market theory can be quite a bad model and that there's zero correlation in markets. And that has 
very significant public policy implications, which I'm not sure the economics profession have have absorbed yet. Mm. The, the, the Economist has gone through a series of almost like a sort of recovering alcoholic over the years has 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 one after the other it's 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 trashed its its own history because uh, I, I only take the economists so that i can i can wait for them to one by one knock down their what's the word shibboleths i mean there's been a great thing about you know the world being anti-experts and uh, how can we ignore economists well in my view the definition of an expert is someone who just occasionally is right so, of course, economists aren't experts. All the evidence is. <laughs> so I do hold grudges. You know, I do hold, a, I do hold some grudges. <laughs> Marcy, what do you think about the legacy? I, I just, you know, it's a great opportunity to get together with you both. And I think that, again, unwittingly, we were at the edge of something, at the leading edge of something that, that became a, a big industry through, David, what, what you've done at Winton and, you know, what Man Group have gone on to do and, and Aspect and many uh, other members of the diaspora. You know, I don't think, of course, we'd like to say it was all down to our genius, but, it, you know, that movement has created an investment management industry that employs hundreds, if not thousands of people that does really useful things for people's savings and pension funds that um, you know, backs uh, deep science uh, in the universities around the country and around the world. You know, that's, that's I think, part of the, the early legacy of AHL. Excellent. On that note, let's wrap up this historic and fascinating conversation recorded live at the Abbey Road Studios in London in celebration of the 30-year anniversary of the awesome story of AHL. Mike, David and Marty, I can't thank you enough for doing this historic and epic podcast with me today. I really appreciate your openness during our conversation. And to all our listeners around the world, let me finish by saying that I hope you got a lot of value from today's conversation. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues and send us a comment to let us know what topics you want us to bring up in the upcoming conversations with industry leaders in Managed Futures. From me, Niels Kastrup Larsen, and our exclusive sponsor, CME Group, thanks for listening, and I look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Roundtable. And in the meantime, go check out all the amazing free resources that you find on cmegroup.com as well as toptradersroundtable.com. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Roundtable. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes or SoundCloud and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review on iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you on the next episode of Top Traders Roundtable.